Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Philip Lindsay, and I'm the communications coordinator at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College in New York. And I'm excited to have you join us for a discussion about the film Les 150, the 150, and what we can learn from the French Climate Assembly. But before we'd like to start, before we start, I'd like to thank the French uh, Studies Program at Bard College and the Center for Civic Engagement for co-sponsoring. And I'd like to introduce our founder and academic director, Roger Berkowitz, to say a word about the Arendt Center. Thanks very much, Phil. And I first want to thank Phil for um, really taking uh, an incredible amount of initiative and, and leadership on a, a lot of the programs that we're doing here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College around citizen assemblies. He's working with uh, a bunch of students, uh, hoping to create a permanent citizen assembly at Bard. Um, and um, uh, we're, we're just working to put the final touches on a program that's going to happen this summer, where we're going to have hopefully 50 uh, government officials from around the United States come and uh, spend uh, three days here learning about how to bring citizen assemblies uh, to their jurisdictions around the United States training program uh, modeled after the G1000 program a couple of years ago in Europe. So very excited about that. And Phil's really been involved with that. He's put together this exciting program along with the students at Bard. And I'm just thrilled to uh, welcome you all here and hope you enjoy uh, what we're out to hear about. Thanks very much, Phil. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Roger. So yes, so I will briefly um, explain the sort of project we're working on. So together with three fe student fellows who are sitting in a room next to me with a bunch of students at Bard College, uh, we at the Hannah Arendt Center are researching citizens assemblies and trying to spread the word, um, including about the summer school this July. Um, and a natural way to do that is through film. And when I found out that the uh, film Les 150 had English subtitles, I thought, let's, let's throw an event, let's get people in the room. Um, I reached out to Agni and she reached out to a lot of the people she knows in this community. And uh, that's really how this event came together. And so thank you Agni so much for your energy and enthusiasm um, on, on that front. Um, so this isn't going to be the last time we, we host an event like this, so please subscribe to our newsletter and I'll put a link to do that um, um, in the chat and in, uh, to everyone who RSVP'd. Um, briefly, the French Climate Assembly has become one of the most well-known assemblies around the world, partly because it emerged at a time of deep political crisis. Um, and also, more than other national assemblies, the average French person knew that the process was happening, and we'll hear more about that. Um, but also in France, uh, France itself has seen many other regional and local lottery-based processes emerge, including a permanent citizens' assembly in Paris, with 100 members selected at random from the public, and that with, with agenda-setting powers. So today we're here to learn from the assembly, the, the French Climate Assembly, learn about these processes, and learn about the film itself. And so I'm going to introduce the speakers, and then we'll get right into a series of about 40 minutes of structured question and answer, and then 40 minutes of open Q&A. And at any time, please feel free to put questions in the, in the Q&A and um, um, some of our experts may respond to you or we can, we can bring the question to the general floor at the end of the, uh, in the second part of the event. So with us today, we have Baptiste Rouget. He's of course the director of the film Les 150, which is available online for free on, on, on YouTube with subtitles if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, Baptiste is also the co-director of the renowned project Seven Billion Others, which involved interviewing 6,500 people in 75 countries. The very impressive uh, resume that Baptiste has. Um, Helene Landemore is a professor of political science at Yale University and author of the book Open Democracy. She was um, and and she's she was an in-person observer of the French Climate Assembly, and she is a member of the core group behind the the group uh, democ democ Democratizing Work. Agni Kapata, and I'm, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, Agni, was it's one of the participants, <laughs> was one of the participants of the French Citizens Convention. She's now uh, the leader of the Citizens Association that pushes for the recommendations of the assembly. Uh, she's featured in the film Les 150, and Agni, again, is the main reason why we have so many wonderful guests with us today. So thank you. Merci, Agni. You're welcome. Um, Dimitri Coran is a visiting fellow at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard Kennedy School. His research focuses on deliberation, representation, democracy, and sortition. Eva Rovers is a cultural historian and author and the director of the Citizens Bureau in the Netherlands, which is studying and improving new forms of deliberative democracy. And she is 
one of the lead researchers of the impact working group within the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies. Marjan Esasi has worked to enhance civil space for civil society in some of the most complex environments, including Cuba, Iran, and North Korea, and is currently pursuing a doctorate at Johns Hopkins with a concentration in representative democracies and comparative government, comparative government-led deliberative mini publics, which are another way to say citizens' assemblies. So they're often called civic, jur uh, civic juries or policy juries, uh, and deliberative mini publics is a beautiful way of summarizing what they are. So I want to start with Batiste. Batiste, so part of what is compelling about a citizen's assembly is that it can galvanize certain conversations, that it puts a certain issue center stage. So please tell us about your making this film and what, what conversations you were trying to uh, put at the center of the film. I think for me, what the, there was uh, the, it was the idea was to, to, to talk about three different topics. There's of course climate change, but I think there's also uh, the need to, to renew, to change our, dem uh, our democracies. And, uh, and last, last of all, I think also it was the, the, the idea of um, uh, trying to face climate change, keeping uh, uh, some fairness and equity in the society. And so uh, I think the, the, the topic, the three topics were really uh, some from very interesting for me. And but I wanted to also to, to try to focus on how this experience being uh, uh, part of this uh, this commission, this parliament, uh, would change uh, some of them through through the, the nine months involvement and then after also. So I was really focusing on uh, on, uh, on on the citizen. Hmm. And what did did you see changes as a as a filmmaker that you that you then were able to document, or what were the most impressionable? What were the the some surprises or changes that you you witnessed? Uh, you know, there were 150 uh, men and women from 16 years old to 81 years old from all over all over the scape of. Uh, Politics, uh, social uh, background, profession, and everything, and out of most of them, from a large part of them, were not even politic uh, politically active. And after the nine months involvement in the in the in the the, the commission, they were ten percent of them went to the local elections, run for local elections. Annie <laughs> Annie was one one of them, so it's ten ten percent. That's a lot, uh, I think. So I think the, the experience had a really a major uh, impact on most of the uh, of the on, on, um, of the citizen who participated. Mm. That's and wonderful. I think yeah, I think it was it was uh, it was a really a very. Um, I mean, the empowerment it gave uh, to 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 these people was uh, huge, and it, it was not only a. A question of uh, knowledge because they had they had the the chance to 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 uh, to see experts from uh, a lot of different uh, uh, subjects for for a year. But most of the most of it was really the 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 feeling to be uh, given uh, the chance to be uh, active to do something to 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 get the the uh, also a, a, a good comprehension of the the the, the problem. And some good ideas on how to face the problem, which is so big and complicated uh, oh. that uh, most of the people feel that they cannot do anything because it's too big, it's too wide, and too, it's too complicated. And uh, and uh, I think uh, it's really a, a great um, example of how we can renew and uh, and uh, bring new blood in uh, in uh, in, uh, in our old democracies. By involving more and more citizens uh, to to bring new ideas, new ways to 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 face things, and also to overcome uh, some of the uh, the lobbies and the the, the powers and the uh, the boundaries that are in place in our systems. That's great. And I have one quick follow-up question, which is: Did you go into the process knowing much about these assemblies or how they worked? I mean, were you also learning with the while as you were making the film? I was no, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't. I was learning uh, uh, during during our during the shooting. Yeah. 
there, I think there was only one at, at that scale, only one experience before in Europe. It was an island on a totally different subject, and uh, it, it was never been done. It has never been done on such a scale, uh, at least in France. And uh, but I was more interested in, interested in uh, in really on uh, the human aspects than really on the how the the whole, the whole uh, process went on. Well, it was a great film and we're lucky to have it as a teaching tool about this. So thank you, Baptiste. Um, okay, so Hélène, we're gonna move on to you. So go going back to 2018 and 2019, can you give us an overview of the, 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 the Convention Citoyenne within, within okay. French politics? And then, and then review for us the, the most important characteristics that distinguished it from other assemblies. And then finally, what should we do better next time? Oh, Elaine, you're muted. Sorry, I was saying in six minutes, it's going to be tough. But um, so, yes, so I was an observer of the convention. And um, I'm so delighted that there are these movies now that we can share with the world. Because honestly, I came at it as an academic. And I, you know, I uh, from the angle of collective intelligence, and I was interested in how a collective like that, made up of uh, randomly selected citizens, can can you know, create smarter solutions to collective problems and elected politicians can, but really what the sort of scientific research cannot quite capture and films can is the human dimension and the, the sort of um, bonding and friendship and, in, and uh, even love that I, I, I you know, I witnessed in, in this, uh, in this convention. So I think that's something that, that arts and, and particularly the visual arts are, are much better at are doing so. A few words about the convention itself as an object. Uh, it was um, convened by President Macron in October 2019, basically as a um, uh, somewhat delayed reaction to um, the Yellow Vest protests in the fall 2018, um, who basically reacted quite, quite you know, violently and 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 strongly and and in some respect completely legitimately to a fuel tax that had been decided, you know, uh, in this arbitrary vertical ways that. Um, French politics has. And um, the first reaction had been the great national debate, which was a sort of pre-run or a trial for, for an, an exercise in collective deliberation. And because it was you know, somewhat successful, at least logistically, that first attempt at uh, organizing regional assemblies and, and you know, deliberation across the country, and because activists were pushing to get a convention at the national level, not just the regional level, Macron eventually relented and under the pressure of um, social movements and activists and academics and all kinds of people, eventually organized this, um, had this uh, convention convened. So 150 people from all over France, including the overseas territories, were brought together for seven sessions. There actually was an extra one uh, after the, 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 the end of the process to allow the citizens to render their judgment about the whole process. And they gave a terrible grade to the government actually. But during the seven sessions, um, they accomplished a lot. And I, and I think uh, to observers like me, it's, it is a success in the sense that they uh, fulfilled their mission. And what was their mission? Their mission was to um, come up with proposals about how to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions, French greenhouse gas emissions by 40% of the 1990s levels in a spirit of social justice. So there was a, a very technical component that mixed up with a very much an ethical and political dimension. So basically how to solve climate change without causing a, a social mobilization like the Yellow Vest, right? And over the course of seven very intense weekends, they managed to come up with proposals that were articulate, sophisticated, informed, um, because they, of course, you know, relied heavily on expert advice and expert consultations. But at the end, to my mind, this was purely their, their product. Uh, they appropriated the materials, they appropriated the, the, the recommendations, and they came up with 149 proposals that um, uh, President Macron had promised initially at the beginning of the, the, the process to put uh, directly without filter, either to a referendum, direct regulation or a parliamentary debate. So in the end, that's not exactly what happened. And uh, this was a source of disappointment for many because um, only 25% roughly, I mean, there are worse estimates and better estimates, but apparently around 25% of the proposals only uh, were turned into law, but it still nurture, uh, sort of nourished the, the most ambitious climate bill to date. 
So I think in France. So I think from that perspective, it's it's um it's a partial success. Um, one regret, perhaps for many, is that it didn't le lead to a referendum. Uh, though there was this uh, opportunity and this choice that was given to the members of the assembly. But um, in terms of the proposal, they chose to not uh, submit them to um, a popular referendum, except um, the proposal to modify the constitution, but that was blocked by the Senate. And so that didn't happen either. So now very briefly, um, so I could say so many things, you know, about the role of experts, um, uh, the nature of the proposals, but um, in, in interest of time, I'll just say a few things about the lessons perhaps that I, I derive or some of the people uh, derive. Well, first of all, it's, it's very important to note that, you know, again, as um, uh, was said before, it was, it's the first time that a citizens assembly um, convened by a national government was successfully conducted in a large multicultural country because previous examples, whether from Canada or from Ireland, um, took place in more homogeneous and smaller units and countries. France is a 60 million people with a large Muslim minority uh, and an even larger ethnically Arab minority. And so it's, it's at least a proof of concept that this can be conducted successfully um, in countries that are much more diverse than Ireland, um, Iceland, or, or perhaps even um, uh, Canada to a degree. The second lesson is that um, it was a, an assembly that um, was tasked also, I think, for the first time to work out the details, at least at the national level, to work out the details of a very specific, uh, of very specific policy proposals. Um, so de facto, this has put the 150 in the position of quasi-legislators. Um, of course, constitutionally, they could never be legislators because that's the role of parliament, but their task was pretty much to produce the same kind of output than a parliament should. And that really caused a lot of pushback from parliament and the Senate and, and, and a lot of elected officials who saw that as competition, basically, or a sort of a way for Macron to shortcut the, uh, you know, the, the, the legal process. So um, this can be bad, this can be good, but that's, I think, what happened in the, in the French case. Um, and third, I would say, and again, I could say many things, but what's really striking is how the French convention quickly became a political actor of its own. Unlike, again, um, I think previous experiments, uh, even in Ireland, to some degree, the, the point was to create a sort of impartial focus group that would sort of come up with um, dispassionate proposals about a very divisive issue. But um, in the French case, what happened is that uh, the citizens appropriated the convention. There was a very visible governance committee at the top of this uh, entity, which got a lot of pushback from the citizens, in part because it was so visible. You know, in, in, in other instances, it tends to be invisibilized as, a, as an organizing committee with no political dimension, but they, all, of course, always have this political dimension. So it raises interesting questions um, if we go forward and start thinking about institutionalizing such bodies and giving them their own you know, legal jurisdiction or, or some sort of um, function in the existing system, who should govern them? Uh, and, and shouldn't we aim for a sort of self-legislating, um, self-ruling entity, uh, whether it's 150 or more people, um, that, that learn to you know, set their own agenda, um, resolve their own conflicts, internal conflicts, and come up to their own decisions without being micromanaged and babysat from the outside by um, what are ultimately expert groups. So I'll stop here and I look forward to the questions. Great, thank you, Elaine, for that overview. Um, so, Agni, we move to you. Okay. Yes. Agni, so, and I will have my sister join me here in case we need translation help, but you are the only participant of, on this panel and so we want to know, how did the, the Convention change you individually? That's the first question. Good afternoon to all. Thank you for your presence. And I'm glad to be here with you on Zoom, but with you. <laughs> and I would like to thank um, Gabrielle and Philippe for organizing this event uh, tonight. Let me introduce myself. My name is Enik Patar. I'm a... Uh, 39 years old and I live in the suburbs of the Paris, in the France. And yes, 
like you said, Philip, I was a participant of the first French Citizens Convention um, on Climate. And let me talk about this process if you want. But uh, Ellen, <clears throat> just like Ellen has said, Citizen Convention on Climate, uh, an unprecedented democratic experiment in France aims to give citizens um, a voice to accelerate the fight against climate change and our models. Um, it was to define a series of measures that will allow to achieve a reduction at least 40% in greenhouse gas emission by um, 13, 2013, because um, compared to 1919 in the spirit of uh, social justice. And was decided by uh, the President of the Republic and the convention brings together 150 people, all drawn by lot. <laughs> and it was to represent more the diversity of the French society. And we have learned about debated and prepared um, drone love on all issues relating to where to combat climate change. And was an, an interesting uh, experience, was really wonderful experience. And <clears throat> Ellen just have said that the president of the Republic had committed to submit this legislative and regulatory proposal without a filter, <laughs> without a filter, as then to a referendum, to a vote in the parliament, or to a direct information. And about this, about um, our proposal, from the end of the convention, we have decided to create this uh, association, Les 150, to follow, to, to, to be able to follow our measurement um, to the process by parliament, uh, with parliament uh, members. So um, just just few words again um, about the random process. Uh, the, young, the youngest members were 16 at, at the beginning, 16, and the oldest was 18 and things. Yes, was really, really, really a good experience. Agnes, so, could, you, could you go a little deeper into like your personal experience? With yes. how it affected you? Did it, yeah. were, you, were you disillusioned by the, the promises, the promises that Macron made or, or you know, were you, were you in, in the end, is it, I have a feeling it changed you uh, dramatically, but I'm curious about that. I just uh, talk about, about uh, just few words about our choice to send or not some of proposal to referendum, for example. Um, we have decided to, to send three of our proposal uh, to referendum. Um, one one of his texts is was about it talk about uh, it re uh, was regarding the preamble of the constitution. One of them is to modify the artic article one of the constitution, and one text was about um, to create to create uh, a crime of ecocide, and we we have really wanted to involve the French people. Uh, to the final dis decision and um, things, some things to the final decision. And the referendum was the right way, but, 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 but. Um, why we chose only this proposal? Because for some of us, uh, referendum is like a kind of response against the government and the president or just, um, were afraid by the fact that most, most of French people will not really understand our proposal um, in the same way because they, they didn't have the, they didn't get information about uh, climate change. Um, one of his point is, uh, was um, that uh, Ellen, uh, Ellen said, said about, about it. It's not really easy to send a proposal to referendum because um, Parliament members have have to have to be agree in the same words and in the exactly same terms, and it wasn't the case. It don't work. So the fact that uh, President of the Republic didn't 
uh, how I can I can do that? Um, um, did not respect his world when he said, "I, I, I take your proposal without a filter." One and the fact that uh, only three proposal to to reform them well, well, they don't, they don't, they don't work. And um, I think this experience was really difficult for some of us because of that. Because of that. Um, it's it's okay. I'm I'm clear enough. Yeah. No. I mean, I, to to summarize uh, for everyone as well, it's like this decision not to send the 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 proposals to referendum were was both a very difficult decision for you all um and it's very well it, there, there are if if people are interested in in uh, seeing another another great film on this the 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 film uh, convention citoyenne Democ mm. democracy and construction also focuses on this decision um and so thank you agni for for sharing and and thank you for again for for being here and for sharing your experience um i'm going to move on to dimitri now so Dimitri, if we could zoom back out from the personal experience and if you could give us um, a sort of overview, you've done very well in, in the past um, to, to, to landscape the sort of spectrum on which these de de deliberative mini publics uh, or citizens assemblies exist. It'd be wonderful to, uh, to hear from you. Sure, um, do, do you want I, uh, I share my PowerPoint? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, uh, I know. Took. Um, you can see, you can see. Yep. Excellent. Okay. I know. Uh, let me just go to presentation so it's better. Uh, voilà. So yeah. Um, so very quickly, <clears throat> um, because yeah, once again the time is limited. Uh, I. I think it it's it's indeed useful to present the um, the convention in its like historical trend that it's contributing to, which are deliberative uh, mini publics, uh, and and that's without going all the way back to Athens. That's a, that's a story that is developed over over several decades. Uh, one of the oldest mini publics, even though it's far from being the, the most uh, famous one, is one I, I directly worked on, which is the High Council of the Military Function. That was created in 1969 in France um, because unions and election were forbidden in the French army and therefore they needed to have another form of representation and deliberation on working condition, pensions, uh, vacation and things like that. So this one is not is not incredibly uh, famous. There is very few work on it. But then the citizen jury and the planning setter in the 70s uh, that were invented simultaneously in, in Germany and in the US uh, got a lot more attention uh there are small panels uh and but they had a lot of success in their diffusion uh, worldwide and they were uh, heavily heavily used for for several decades um then the third types of mini publics were the consensus conference or citizen conference that were implemented in the late 80s first in denmark and then uh, in switzerland in england in france and uh, austria and other countries uh, that were more that they're also small panels of around 30 citizens and they are more targeted toward debate on controversial technologies and uh, and risks that are linked to that and then fourthly there is the deliberative polling invented in the 90s by uh, professor james fishkin uh, that are way bigger in size and actually are the only type of, of mini public almost that can actually use proper random selection like unfiltered a random selection because the sample is, is way bigger than than other uh, assemblies not getting all the way to to the thousands but but several several hundreds um they are short and they are not as connected to the decision as uh, as citizen assemblies and citizen initiative review so moving on to citizen initiative review they were invented uh in the early 2010s first in oregon uh and then they they spread to California, to Massachusetts, and another state in the US, and were imported to Switzerland uh, two, three years ago, and to Finland as well. Where uh, so this is a type of citizen jury, but that is connected to producing uh, impartial information for um, for a population before a referendum or a, a citizen initiative. And then finally, 
uh, citizen assemblies, which became the generic term to speak about all types of many publics, but at the beginning were uh, one type of many publics among among others, uh, are, have been first experimented in, in Canada, uh, British Columbia, then Ontario, uh, starting in 2004. Um, on electoral reform and then in the Netherlands. So actually the first European citizen assembly is, is the Netherlands in 2006 uh, on electoral reform uh, and then developed in the constitutional process in Iceland uh, and then in Ireland. Uh, so I worked directly on, on the Irish case and Ellen worked on the Icelandic case. Uh, and there were also uh, interesting experiments of civil society led assemblies uh, in Belgium with the G1000 and in Australia with the Australian uh, citizen parliament. So those uh, type of, and I put some pictures to give you an idea of how they look. So they are varying in size, they're varying in length, they're varying in output. Uh, and I think maybe that's the, that's the thing we could, um, we could focus on, which is the fact that there are three um, dimension that could be taken into account, usually in, in analysis of deliberative mini publics, which is the input. Uh, that focus both on uh, the selection of the participants and how representative or not they are, um, but also the shape of their agenda. Do they have a lot of uh, room in adapting the agenda or is it very top down and very narrow? Um, then there is the throughput, which is the way the deliberation is going to be conducted. Who are the experts that are invited? How are the, the speaking time uh, managed, the facilitation? How is the vote? Uh, organized and then there is the output which uh, sometimes is, is most of the focus is, is there which is what effect uh, the citizen assembly are going to have especially in regards to shaping public policy triggering constitutional reform leading to referendum being implemented into laws uh, and i think uh, so i'm going to stop the the screen share um so um yeah i think um the on both on all those three uh, dimensions, there is uh, work to be done and conducted. And I think, for instance, we could think of, of ways of um, improving the, the input by rendering, for instance, uh, uh, by making more inclusive and participatory the way of setting the agenda for the citizen assembly and not just letting politicians decide what they deem to be a, a good topic to give to citizen assembly and how to do the phrasing. Um, then, in terms of throughput, uh, there is a lot, a lot of work to uh, to still be conducted, and, and with colleagues, we we work, we observe the and and then one of one of us uh, the the citizen assembly in its proceeding in France, uh, and uh, and in terms of throughput, we saw things that were excellent and things that were uh, still needed to be uh, to be improved, especially given the time constraint that was put and time was really. Uh, a gun put to the head of many citizens at some point because you need you want to deliberate more but you don't have time um so that that's something that definitely can be improved and especially in terms of managing the relationship between expert and citizen uh and then in terms of output i think uh france is a clear warning that uh that there is still a lot of work to be done here and indeed i think the the connection with referendum is preferable uh as a systematic manner of being sure to include what we call the maxi public, which is the, the rest of the population and not only those who had the chance of being randomly selected. And I'll stop there. Well, that is a perfect segue into our next panelist, Eva. Um, Eva, please tell us about impact. Dimitri gave us a great uh, sort of uh, launching us off the runway of, of the, the setup of a, of a citizens assembly. So please tell us about the, the impact working group that you're with at, at KNACA, at the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies, uh, what you're doing there, what you're researching, and maybe what some of your preliminary findings are, are on, on how citizens assemblies can have a, a, a impact built into some of the design as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and also, also thank you for organizing this, uh, this event. I think it's wonderful that uh, this way we can um, tell more about climate citizens assemblies um, and uh, the experiences we are um, having here in Europe. Um, I'm um, a researcher uh, at the, the Knowledge Network of, of, on Climate Assemblies, uh, assemblies which is a uh, initiative of the European Climate Foundation. And uh, KNOKA is, uh, well, it's, it's a network and uh, a knowledge hub for 
basically everyone seeking input on the design and implement implementation of climate assemblies. So, well, we hope to offer both thorough academic knowledge, but also really practical guidance for anyone involved in climate assemblies, be it practitioners, grassroots organizations or policy makers. Um, yeah, and my research, uh, research focuses on um, the various pathways to impact. So we, we are trying to pinpoint the features that increase both the political and the social impact of climate assemblies. Um, and we, uh, with this research, we try to, for we hope to enable public commissioners, uh, assembly organizers, process designers to really learn from the deliberative processes in the past to, well, improve future climate assemblies. Um, yeah, so, well, the basic question, of course, is which features um, help this political or social impact? Well, one of the, the main uh, features uh, is uh, the scope, the scope of the remit. Uh, this definitely shouldn't be too broad. It should be ambitious, but if it's too broad, which in a way in France it was, um, this, this usually leads to a lot of recommendations. So the broader the scope, the more recommendations and the more recommendations, the more reason there is for politicians to, for, for cherry picking. So um, it's, and, this is very difficult because you don't want a very small remit. You want to be that there's something at stake, uh, but there has to be um, uh, a certain frame uh, work within which you can make proper recommendations, uh, but not an incredible <laughs> amount of recommendations. Because if you offer 149 recommendations, it's pretty much uh, for sure that politicians will go cherry picking. Um, uh, also, um, in the preparation phase, there's usually uh, a lot of focus on the process itself. So making sure that there's a proper sortition, proper design. But in this very early stage, in this preparation phase, it's really crucial to already look further. So to already develop a follow-up plan um, it should be really clear from the start what political entity will respond when to the recommendations and what this political follow-up will look like. So what conditions, for instance, must these recommendations fulfill to become law? Will there be a referendum? At what time? Uh, what conditions are there? Um, and also the commissioning authority should be or at least have the full support of the legislative uh, authority. So in other words, the person making the promise of political follow-up should also be the person who can keep that promise. Um, and uh, Dimitri also mentioned uh, the engagement of the, of the wider audience, uh, making sure that the rest of the society, the people who are not in the citizens' assemblies uh, are very well aware that it's that it is taking place, why it is taking place, how people are selected, uh, what information um, they are using. Um, so th this makes it um, that it is credible, uh, that it has some legitimacy also in the rest of society. And it also makes sure that there's more um, political pressure or more so, uh, uh, social pressure on politicians to really follow up on these uh, recommendations. <coughs> and of course, there are, there are several ways to, to engage the um, uh, public at large, not only by making sure that they know of the Citizens' Assembly, there are, um, uh, we discussed the, the, the uh, option of having a referendum, but there are also other ways which are perhaps a little less polarizing than a referendum, uh, but perhaps we can go into that later on um, um, when we discuss why uh, the Citizens' Assembly of France did not choose uh, to go for a referendum. Yeah, I, I definitely wanna come back to that point. Um, and also about a possible digital or, or you know, through Zoom participation of, of, of people in certain panels. The one exciting thing I've heard about is, is sort of a hybrid model of having an in-person assembly, but then there's also benefits to having online participation where people can actually um, either, either experts are called through Zoom 
uh, to participate live or um, or the public themselves are able to watch some some aspect of the assembly live. So let's go. Let's come back to that. And muted myself, Marjan. Um, so to bring us home, to bring us back before we open up the floor, Marjan, can you, what does your research tell us about the impacts of this assembly, not on policy necessarily directly, but on participants themselves? Um, and so we, we, we know that you're conducting comparative case studies. And I think the best way to learn about this, in my opinion, is through com comparing. Um, so can you share some of your findings and, and what you found uh, particularly interesting about the French assembly, what worked, what didn't work, but in the comparative method. Sure, thank you, um, Philip. It's such a pleasure to be here and uh, really an honor to be on a panel with so many of you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, Philip, and also, frankly, to be on a panel that organized by the Hannah Arendt Center is a, is a true highlight for me. Um, I thought I would take a few moments just because there's some students just to talk about how I got here. Um, I, um, my route is a little bit circuitous. I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I'm actually a litigator who then spent 15 years in international development. And um, the work that I was doing in international development was mostly rule of law and governance based um, and basically strengthening demo democratic institutions around the world. And um, I have to share a story with you because I have been over the past couple of years with a uh, past couple of weeks with uh, Secretary Albright's passing. I've been thinking a little bit about my own roots and I spent a few years at the National Democratic Institute. And during the time that I was there, we had inter-party dialogues with um, the Communist Party of China. And um, a couple of times a year, they would come to the States and we went to China. And it was the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and um, the International Department of the Communist Party of China. And during one of our dinners in Beijing, one of the gentlemen um, was kind of pressing me on why we insisted on working on mainland China and Hong Kong so much. And he looked at me straight in the eye at one point and he said, don't you think you should be working on strengthening political institutions in your own country? Um, that was in 2011, 2012. Uh, he knew what he was talking about. For me, really, the wake up call came in 2016 when I decided to really shift my focus from doing international work to looking at our own democracies. And so I joined um, the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University a couple of years ago in their doctoral um, practitioners program. So it's a, it's a two to three year um, doctoral program that has been set up at SICE. And in shifting my focus, um, my goal was really threefold. I was really interested in identifying a problem statement. And unlike many of us in the United States who just like to diagnose problems, I was really keen to then try and find some innovative solutions to the problem statement and then to be able to measure their impact against my specific problem statement. So for me, the problem statement really um, was the lack of meaningful input and real voice for citizens um, to truly engage in consequential ways in political and social decision-making. And so for the purposes of my research, I've developed a working definition of what an engaged citizen is, and then I've disaggregated that working definition to five different variables. So I then measure the impact of deliberative mini publics against those variables. So my definition of an engaged citizen is one who is one, informed, two, one who is connected, three, one who's enthusiastic, four, one who participates in political issues, and then five, has consequential voice. Um, and here, of course, I put the, for me, at least in my, in my thesis, the onus is largely on government to provide those kinds of environments for citizens. Um, and as Philip mentioned, uh, my thesis is a comparative study of three different deliberative mini publics, one of which we've been talking about the CCC in France, one in Belgium, the city of Brussels, and another one in Canada. Um, and there isn't enough time to really get into the details of, of the data that I'm collecting. But for the purposes of this panel, when I examine the five variables within the context of the French CCC, based on my empirical evidence, which is all qualitative, and it's based on um, in-depth interviews, surveys, and also some observant sort of participant observations, there is definitely increase um, across each of the five variables. But again, you know, the devil is really in the details. And many have sort of brought up some of the components that should have been improved. And there's no question in the four categories that I look at, um, one of which is design integrity, then the other one is composition, one is process and sound deliberation, and the fourth is government promise and presence, 
um, there's a lot that could have been done differently in, in each of those different areas. A few of the missed opportunities, I think, that really, um, in my research, diluted the potential for more increase in perceptions of consequential voice and effervescence, one of which is, of course, the sans filtre promise. I think that there's no question that the government should have really handled that dif differently. I think it should have been very clear and it should have been clarified from the beginning that the CCC was truly consultative and that there was really no binding decision to be made. Um, I think second, I think there was excessive government's meddling. I think government was not neutral and was far too involved. Um, throughout the process in all sorts of different ways that we can discuss. Um, I think the lack of government follow-up really hurt citizens and their perceptions of the value and the meaning of their work. Um, and then finally, I think it has been raised a couple of times, I think the number of proposals and recommendations um, is an issue. And I think a lot of other citizens assemblies uh, forums are actually thinking about limiting the number of proposals currently. Um, and I do have to say that the whole draft law as a, as a, as a deliverable, I, I, I hear what Ellen was saying, but I also think that, you know, citizens were learning so much that I think it really made them question and made their position a little bit weak to have to formulate draft laws. Um, in the final analysis, though, I want to say that I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that it was a visionary experiment and that many of the CCC proposals have been approved and that the CCC participants, I think, should be really proud that they move the climate agenda forward. Um, I also think that the duration of the, of, of, of the French experiment and the attention that participants uh, received gave rise to a huge sense of empowerment, um, increased connections and confidence, which I think also makes for a really interesting conversation about voice and how we, 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 we work that when we're designing citizens' assemblies. Um, in closing, I think the CCC was no doubt imperfect, and I think more generally DMPs are just works in progress. But as I look at my peers um, on this panel and also across the deliberative committee, I'm, I'm confident that we're asking all the right questions and refining these processes in a way that will allow them to deliver um, their true potential. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful way to wrap up the first the first half. So thank you, Marjan. And thanks for that personal story. That was very, I, I appreciated that. Um, Okay, so I have a. I'm gonna uh, read a few, uh, one, uh, at least two questions directly that we have from our students, and then at this point, it's really fair game for the Q and A. Anyone who has, uh, who's already put a, a question in the chat and wants to, um, um, wants to have it raised to the floor, please, please put it back in the in the Q and A if it hasn't been, if we haven't seen it. Um, I've seen a couple times questions about expertise, um, so. I'm curious both at the French level and people can bring in other um, examples. Um, and this is for the floor, I'll, I'll see who jumps on this one first, is how, how were the experts um, both um, chosen in the French process and were, were citizens at all involved in that process? Should they be? Um, and, are then, and, and that's the first question and there's a follow-up question about how uh, whether or not the experts are trained in communication before they're um, before they present, and uh, so I'm I'm curious who wants to take the first question about how were the experts chosen in the French case, and were there lessons learned from that? It's only for the question. Is on. It's, oh, it's it's for the floor. Does anyone particularly want to know more about that than than Elaine, Dimitri, or? Elaine? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, you have to um, realize that there was a lot of improvisation. And so this was put together over a summer, probably pretty much. The governance committee, uh, you know, I think put up a list of experts that seemed available at the time, ready to go, represented a spectrum of opinions. I think they had an ambition at the beginning to set up the advice in, in a sort of adversarial format, you know, with the pros and the cons, say, I don't know, you excluded nuclear power from the discussion, but you, you could have had a discussion on that or, or on, on um, I don't know, electric cars or on, on carbon tax, but in the end, they didn't do that. So it was not in the format that was adversarial. And these were not people whose recruitment was super transparent, to be honest. So I think they, that there's a lot to improve on the selection process. I, I do think they tried their best to have a diversity of perspectives, but you know there was a 
diversity of formats in which the the the, the experts intervene. So you know there was speed dating, there were lectures. So it was it was all a bit um, seemingly arbitrary, you might say. Uh, but that doesn't mean to me that they were that the um, you know experts were able to capture the citizens if that's a worry or, or that the governance committee sort of plugged certain you know perspectives intentionally i think it was more unintentional and chaotic than that the main example of, of the way the citizens were not captured in my view is their um a, a response to the carbon tax because really the carbon tax was like the number one solution that economists in particular pushed on them um, and they didn't follow on that recommendation. And then they, the, the citizens chose to, in fact, they rejected it quite vehemently. Uh, so it's a long story, but th there was a small minority in favor of the carbon tax, but there were vocal objections in plenaries. And in the end, they, none of the 149 proposals include a carbon tax. Um, and then they chose some of the advisors, indeed, because as, as the weekends went on, you know, they got more power. First of all, two members of the 150 were put on the governance committee uh, at random. They selected two random, two random citizens to be part of the governance committee. So they had some input on the choice of, uh, of experts. For example, they chose to bring in um, the pr pr previous um, Minister of Ecology, uh, Nicolas Hulot, who very much endorsed the idea that came from the floor of an ecocide and had been pushing for it himself, I think, uh, separately. So, you know, they, they had some say. It wasn't all imposed from the top. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ellen. And um, just, just to complete, just to complete, uh, at the first time, um, the committee governance uh, as the first, sorry, as the first time the committee governance uh, have decided to uh, to help us to understand the mandate and objective of the convention and understand climate change and its consequences. So they they um, they have decided to choose uh, at the first time uh, uh, the experts, but we have also asked to uh, uh, some of the experts uh, like uh, Ellen Ellen says. Um, even <clears throat> even if <laughs> uh, even if um, we worked in the different thematic different group um, and someone we have we have asked to to hear some people even if they they wasn't um, in uh, agree um, uh, and <laughs> sorry uh, and. Uh, and things that really, really, really important for us uh, to, um, to 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 understand the the real impacts and the real consequences, and experts help us uh, in, by this way. Thank you for for both of those answers, Elena and Agni, uh, Dimitri, and then Marjan. Um, yeah, so I think. The, the the question of experts is really a good one because um, no matter how how much um, self thought and and critical thinking the citizen can have, they are they, they are bound to be influenced by experts. And when I when I use the word influence, I don't mean that in a bad way. If if a deliberative process is a process of influence through arguments, reasons, information, otherwise you vote directly uh, and you don't talk, uh, or you don't invite experts to give talks. So 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 influence is expected. Uh, the problem that I think happens in many publics and, and in the CCC is how do you reach an influence that that can be deemed fair, uh, uh, a just form of influence. And I think there, so I did a comparative analysis of Ireland and and France, and I think. Uh, for various reasons, the French far didn't didn't manage as well as the as the Irish did. Uh, in in several regards, I'm not going to manage to go into detail, unfortunately. But if, if you're interested, feel free to write me or to to check what I what I wrote. Um, but I think one of the problem was that there was a, a big asymmetry in the way experts were treated. Uh, Ireland, they were all treated the same way, which means they all had access to the entirety of the assembly. They were talking to the entire assembly and they had the same speaking time. And most of the time they were not alone. They had a competing 
expert to potentially disagree with them. And the French uh, assembly didn't follow this model at all. They, some speaker had two hours, some had five minutes, some had 10, some had 20. Some could talk to a group of 150, some could talk to a group of uh, 30, some could talk to a group of 10. So um, that, that was kind of a problem. And then also, even though they managed to have a good diversity, I would say in terms of type of people speaking, uh, something that was a bit surprising for me and some of the observer was the fact that the disagreement was not clearly voiced. So you had someone from the right of the spectrum and someone from the left, but they were not explicitly making their argument and counter argument clash. They were presenting their position, but you could not exactly understood, uh, understand what was the, the disagreement on. So I think that could definitely be improved for the next, um, for the next ones. Also, uh, I think something that would be interesting would be um, um, a trans more transparency precisely about what I call meta deliberation. So the deliberation on the deliberation. Uh, and for instance, choice of the expert who were the candidate that were considered, why in the end was it Mr. X instead of Mrs. Y? Uh, that would be something I think like um, having like track records of that available mm -hmm. to the public would increase transparency and therefore legitimacy of the process. It was not done because they were working on high pressure uh, with little time. Uh, but I think for the future, that's, that's definitely better. And to, uh, and to answer to maybe two of the Q&A uh, quickly, uh, regarding the one on um, the, in, like, does the CA balance the ability for citizens to write legislation against the ability of corporation and third parties? Well, there is still third parties involved in the fact that uh, uh, Comité Logistique, so experts and lawyer were helping to actually uh, translate the, the proposition into uh, into acceptable measure, but uh, where the influence of uh, of cooperation and and powerful interest happened was after the convention during the the moment where the recommendations were put on the desk of the president and then passed to ministers and then uh, the conventions the, the the representative of special specific interest put in and that's where they did most of their work and then very quickly to answer uh, David's question. Uh, to my knowledge, there is nothing planned, uh, and Macron is not really mentioning anything. Um, CESA is continuing to experiment, but it's very, it's, it's very small, it's not the same. Uh, but uh, I don't think there is big, big plans uh, so far for, for follow-up. Uh, Thank you, Dimitri. Marjan? <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of points to the expert question, because I think it's a really, really good one. And it's also very, um, it, it sort of, it, it, it goes into the larger bucket of sort of information and what type of information we're providing to citizens during these processes. Um, I just wanted to make a few points. My, one of the survey that I did across um, France, Belgium in Brussels, as well as the Canadian experiment, which was another national citizens assembly, Overwhelmingly, one of my questions was whether citizens felt like it would have been helpful to have experts speak to each other, basically debate one another. And overwhelmingly, participants said that they would like to have seen debates in all three countries or three all three contexts, I should say. Um, and so I think that you know we're asking citizens for a lot, especially I mean France. There was a lot of time in most of these citizens assemblies. It's really short the period of time for information gathering. And I think the more that we can make it easy to acquire information. So put people in conversation or experts in conversation with each other. I think it's really helpful. Um, another point in Brussels, they, they, they have larger presentations, but then they allow citizens to ask questions of those experts in smaller groups, which was really helpful. They weren't able to do this with all experts, but where they were able to do this, I think it was very helpful. Also, I think um, having the ability to ask experts to come back. I mean, you're listening to their, their presentations. Oftentimes, all of us will have questions after the fact. And so having that ability to sort of um, ask questions and have experts come back um, and answer questions afterwards, I think is really important as well. And again, um, this last comment is, is not so relevant to the French experience because there was more, more time, but where time is limited, I do think that we really have to think more um, thoughtfully about the amount of time that we allocate to information gathering. Thanks. Helene, you had something to say. Yes, I, because I um, actually, uh, Macron announced another convention for the fall on uh, end of life issues. So mm. 
Mm. It looks like there's going to be another one. And actually, so I'm, I'm in, sort of in touch with the CESO and they, they've been thinking about various themes. End of life has been the dominant one for a few months now. They've talked about also things like, um, you know, the digital, you know, digital things. Uh, mm. they, they've talked about, they, they also consider the democratic renewal. So that would be a much more fundamental issue that I, I think would be more relevant to today's problems. But at the same time, I've come around to this idea of another convention on end of life issues, because I don't know, I, I'm not super enthusiastic, but I think there's a point to it, which is that basically you secure a sort of a, win like the Irish one. It would be on a big moral issues that doesn't require quite as much technical knowledge as climate um, change. And you can do that perhaps on fewer weekends. And given the state of public opinion in France right now, you, you guarantee yourself a positive referendum. And, and that, I mean, it's, it can be very cynical to look at it that way. And I'm sure that's how it's looked at, at you know, uh, at the Elysee. But at the same time, from, from a more um, practical point of view, uh, you know, as somebody who believes in these assemblies, I think it would be good for friends to have a second case where it really leads to, like, like Dimitri said, a connection, uh, uh, or Mariano, sorry, I don't remember who said that, but the, the connection to the macro public. Uh, it's really important to, to, to expand the, the, the deliberation to the rest of the, of the country. And there was this missed opportunity in the first assembly, so maybe something on end of life where you know people in France are coming around to this issue of euthanasia, that could be you know it doesn't seem like the priority to me given the the war, given all the things happening around the world, but maybe it could be a a next step, you know, sort of normalization of the use of those conventions. Very interesting. I I wanted to come back to this idea of. Um, uh, mass participation in the, the the citizens' assemblies themselves, and if uh, if you know, I mentioned the idea that that um, for instance, or the, the last question on experts, I've heard that that some assemblies, or at least have have thought about introducing the possibility of a hybrid assembly where it is online, where getting an an, an expert, for instance, if it's on climate or another issue, it's on end of life issues, where you're able to bring someone in who normally wouldn't be able to attend the assembly, but you can do it digitally, you can do it on Zoom, and they can immediately respond to questions from the participants. Are there experiences like this? Have they been seen to be effective? What do you all, what, what do you all think about these? Uh, Marianne? Maybe we'll go. We'll go to the the. I like that there's the voluntarily hand raising. We're going to go. To, I'll go to the system. Uh, yeah. So I just I wanted to uh, to that point. I don't think it was really intentional, but because of COVID, um, the my third case study, which is the Canadian Assembly on Democratic Expression, which happened in the fall, they began their sessions in September, and because of COVID, they weren't able to have all the sessions in person, and so four or five of the sessions were online and experts, all of it happened online. And they were able to then pace them. And then I think it was two or three weeks between sessions. And then all of us met in Ottawa for five days at the culmination in November for the deliberation and the writing of the proposals. And I think that the implementers and the organizers felt like that was actually a really good model because one, as you mentioned, Philip, I think it does allow access to experts who wouldn't otherwise be available to come in and meet with the, um, with the participants. But also the kind of having those digital sessions over time, I think is really helpful for reflection and it allows I think the participants to also think through what they're what they're learning so I think that they are helpful I will say that at least my perspective I'm curious to hear other people's opinion but I do think that um, at least from the angle that I'm looking at this in terms of building connections and relationships amongst participants and, and hopefully leading to more social cohesion I do think the in-person is just extremely valuable okay uh, uh, Eva yeah, I just wanted to add, um, we've uh, had a Climate Citizens Assembly here in Amsterdam, where uh, even before the uh, assembly took place, we asked the participants or the people who had been selected to uh, let us know what kind of information they thought they needed. So not all information was prepared for them. It was asked, the, the participants were asked, who would you like to hear? What experts do you want to hear from? What kind of information do you think you need? So that's also a way in which 
the participants um, are more actively involved in uh, the, the uh, uh, information that they receive. And because it was partly online, uh, this we could also keep on doing that during the process. So there were also there were people who, for instance, said, uh, we want to hear from, uh, in this case, Kate Rayworth, the ec uh, economist, and she was able to attend because it, it was partly uh, online. Uh, but this was really at the request of the participants. So it makes it also more flexible if you have, this was a hybrid event. So there were the, most of the delibera deliberations were, uh, in, or, were live. People were meeting face to face, but there were some interactions with uh, the experts that were um, online. And it really helped to make it, um, well, to, to cater in a way the participants uh, to really, um, um, while this process was, was taking place, we could, um, to some extent, it was very short, but to some extent we could um, uh, invite the experts that the participants wanted to hear from, which probably would have been more difficult if it was all um, uh, in one place, if it was all live. Thank you, Eva. I just want to mention briefly, Margot Becker uh, puts in the chat the, the, uh, making, highlighting the global assembly on climate change that was carried out over 11 weeks. 100, 100 people across different time zones could only be possible with, with on online platforms. Um, uh, Dimitri and then Elaine. So I think the, so online can bring good things. And actually in France, they had a lot of webinars, uh, which were mm. between sessions where like they were using that time between sessions to, to talk to experts. I'm, I tend to be a bit critical of webinar because at some point the CCC became something where uh, basically it was difficult to have a life on the side. Uh, it was taking so many evenings. And I think uh, to an extent citizen assemblies are meant so that ordinary citizens can, can participate. And if you have to be a super citizen with like all your evenings available over several weeks, then uh, maybe you're not that ordinary anymore, and, and maybe uh, maybe that skewed the sample. Uh, but going back to going back to expert and expert selection, uh, I think the the problem of um, of the webinar as well and on some formats is once again that I I think it's good to want to have the mini public as informed as you want, but you also want to have the macro or maxi public as informed as you want, and that in, in, implies that everything needs to be as public as possible and everything needs to be in a format that is as accessible as possible and as away from like technical jargon uh, that is hermetic to people so what you want and i think in that regard once again the the irish assembly did a good job in the sense that they were really checking before like that the fact that the expert, the experts were to speak in plain english uh in order for it to be fully understandable by everybody um, and I think at, at some point in the CCC, it, it started to be really hard to follow. Like the, uh, the early session were okay. And then the late session <laughs> were really difficult. Like when they were starting to talk about ah, the two enter bancaire, it was difficult. Uh, and I, I think in a sense, that's what you want when you want to have detailed proposal, but like, how do you not lose everybody else on the side? Uh, and I think the problem that that there is as well, I, I understand the point of letting citizens decide who they want to hear, and I think that's a good way of including their voice and their, their, their choice. The issue with that is that you are, with that thing, you are crediting whoever is famous as in the in the in the landscape, right? So whoever is a famous expert that goes on TV is going to be chosen, maybe maybe if he's not. Uh, actually a, a real scientist or, or, or a, a, like relevant person. Uh, so I think that it's important for the organizer to also uh, be careful about balancing that. And, and I think, the, honestly, I would say the best way of doing it is to have contradictory debate, which to be sure that if you have someone defending a position, you have to invite someone else from the other side. And in that regard, the, the type of mini public that is the most uh, credible in my eyes and is the citizen initiative review because because you debate on an issue that's going to be put in a referendum that means that groups experts uh public figure politicians are mobilized for and against publicly and if you invite one from one side you invite one from the other side and it goes like that it's more difficult to do an open problem like climate but i think it's something you should definitely strive towards if you want your process to remain credible
Len. Yes, yes. Um, so just your, your question about um, the, the virtual, the, you know, digital tools is interesting because I do think that uh, it changes the dynamic a little bit um, between participants. And in particular, I think it allows for people who are a little bit more shy to speak uh, more easily because on Zoom, we're all like little squares on the screen. It's, it's in, bizarrely less intimidating. It's something I've noticed with my, with my students as well. And whereas in a plenary assembly, you know, in, in an environment, somewhat, somewhat intimidating environment of a, of a mm. large uh, amphitheater or, you know, an auditorium or something like that, I think women typically will, will speak less. I mean, the, the, the men spoke a lot more during the plenaries than, than um, than women so so i think it's nice it's like if you multiply the, the sort of uh, setups you get a diversity of voices that get expressed differently so it, i think it can be good i think you lose a little bit the connection it's true but at the same time we, we are you know human beings are the imaginative species and so if you have maybe one meeting that's presential every three meetings i think it's enough to maintain a connection and and it's true that i'm glad the global assembly was mentioned because I think at that scale, probably it will have to be most of the most of such meetings would have to be virtual. I wanted also to mention the, the, the Chilean case. I, I, I know very little about it, but I know that um, the Senate in Chile uh, organized uh, a year ago, I think it was 2021, um, a, de a deliberative poll. So a, a group of 400 randomly selected uh, Chileans who came together to discuss public health issues. Uh, and they were facilitated by, it was all virtual, and it was facilitated by an automated, um, by, by an AI, basically, an artificial intelligence, very basic one, but that sort of kept time and distributed, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the speaking rights and, and sort of led people towards conclusions. I mean, something, something quite simple, but that, you know, saved time and money, I guess. And that, you know, if we do that well, maybe that's the future for such meetings. On experts, I wanted to add something too, which is that we talked about the experts on substance that were consulted, but there were also experts on process, right? That were brought in to organize the whole thing. And they were private consultants like Mission, Mission Publique and, and Res Publica. And these people are very good at what they do, but they come in with scientific assumptions or, or at least not scientific assumptions, but practical assumptions about what's good and what needs to be achieved and how you, you, need, you need to organize things to get results um, over a certain period of time. That, what, that's, that explains why you got 149 proposals produced over seven weekends. I think it's because one, they, they're very good at generating output. They, they will squeeze the citizens until they produce some, 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 some answers, but they don't want fighting and disagreement. So they go for the most consensual approach, which in my view is not necessarily always good. I mean, it's good to maintain the peace between the citizens, but it's also bad because to some degree you, you eliminate the possibility for like really uh, different worldviews to emerge and real fundamental debates to take place. So in the end, there were only very few moments during the, the seven weekends where there were um, massive disagreement was, uh, or, or debates at least on the carbon tax, on uh, uh, a shorter uh, working week and something else I forget. So, so you know, the, on the CETA, on, uh, on international treatises and, and I think we have to rethink what expertise do these people bring on the basis of what and can we do better in particular as an academic community a, a community of citizens a community of activists a community of practitioners can we can we you know do more to question the, the practices uh, that are implemented because they really shape a lot of the outcomes thank you Alain. uh agni, mm -hmm. agni. Uh, we want to bring it nine months and we work by the both both way um uh, at uh, economic social and um, environmental council uh terrace and Fasafas. and especially during uh, the social movement we have to to work uh, on zoom by webinar and i'm saying that we need the, the, the both way because as ellen just has said uh some <laughs> some of participants some of uh, some of citizens um do not talk at all um during the plenary session but they really in they was really involved they, they, they was more involved during our uh work um in small groups and um 
and things, we have not to choose only one way. Sorry. So. Um, okay, so one, another question from Scott Henstrand. Uh, for all the participants, speaking from the US, the level of money influencing legislators is truly incredible. Uh, is this also the situation in France and how, do, how can Citizens Assembly possibly address this issue? Who wants to take that one on? Dimitri. So once again, uh, I think precisely like the, um, the whole point of a, of a good deliberation in Citizens Assembly would be precisely to, to give each position as much time which means that money then becomes irrelevant there. Uh, and, uh, and then you need to have the best argument. I mean, one could make a point that with money, you can buy very good speakers, but yeah, your speaker has 20 minutes and the other one has 20 minutes, so, or, or more or less, but uh, that, that, can be, that can be precisely one of the space where money is less important and where you can equalize position. This provided that you actually give the same speaking time to people. Uh, which was not always the case. Uh, another problem that that uh, I could spot in the CCC vis-a-vis -vis Ireland was also the fact that some people were bringing books to give to participants or uh, like nice, very nice, fascicule, uh, I don't know how you call that in English, but like uh, uh, booklets and, and things like that. Uh, and other cannot afford to, to print out uh, like 150 nice book, book or booklets. To, to give to everybody and, and in, in Ireland it was not possible. So you, you need to have a standard, standardized uh, handout and everybody was the same number of signs and format and that was sent to everybody and same for the PowerPoint. Uh, so that was a way of, of making it a bit uh, more equalized there. But then you're going to have the, the influence of money by I think um, several, several other um, channels. The first one is the fact that uh, if you manage to invade public debates beforehand uh, or during the deliberation, it means that the panelists are already going to have those ideas put in their head because that's what they heard on TV and on radio and that's what the dominant discourse says. So when they hear an idea that is not going with that dominant discourse, they're going to be shocked, they're going to be like, oh, that's weird, why should we do that? And it's going to be way harder to uh, to fight that if it's already in the public debate so then a long deliberation is is actually required uh, the second manner that it can happen is uh, and i think it was very clear for the ccc uh, is the fact that if uh, on your tv channel when there is a proposition by the by the assembly you have a lot of editorialists and journalists uh, and slash experts and everything that's going to say oh my god they're crazy they're like uh, radicals and uh, that's so ridiculous what they're proposing it's actually affecting the participants it was very clear in the ccc when they had the debate on the referendum they were like oh they were saying we were ridiculous on tv i don't want to to you know it's going to affect our credibility um so so that can be something and, and it was private tv channels that mainly um, led the charge there and then the third uh, the third and uh, no the yeah, third third aspect is going to be when it's actually on the desk of the government, which is clearly what happened. And you have a, a rapport uh, by the Observatoire des Multinationales that, that shows how a lobbyist uh, acted after the convention to be sure that the law, the, the proposed, the bill proposed is different from the convention proposition. And then the last manner, but we didn't have that in France, would be during the, the campaign if you don't have regulation on how you spend money in campaign, which is the case in Switzerland, but for instance, it's not the case in France, uh, where you, uh, money is a bit more tightly regulated. And here you have the work, for instance, of Julia Cagé on how, how money can influence votes. Um, so I think yeah, those four aspects to be uh, taken into account. And uh, yeah, in the US, it's worse, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it begs the question of whether there has been a, a campaign finance citizens assembly. I mean, it's one thing I've imagined in, in the U.S. Of, of a citizen assembly that brings brings forth questions on on uh, electoral reform, campaign finance reform. But um, one other one other question that's come up in the chat is uh, a question of how a citizen assembly can serve as an educational tool to. Uh, uh, disseminate information in the public, whether it's about climate change or a public health issue. So I'm curious if, um, you know, whether it's Eva or, or, or someone else wants to respond to this, this idea of how can institutions, you know, is it, you want to, you want to isolate or contain a citizen's assembly so that it can make deliberation, but you also want it to be part of this maxi public. So how do we, 
is there a way, are there, are there ways to include universities so that universities are, are you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the Socratic dialogue where you have a, a one circle and another circle and another circle uh, looking towards the center circle that's all deliberating. Are there, are there models of how best to do this that, that uh, certain, certain case studies that you would point to or anyone who wants to speak to this issue of how the CA itself can be an educational event? I absolutely think it has that potential, but uh, for me, I, I couldn't uh, point out a specific um, uh, example of what you're suggesting right now, like the, the Socratic uh, 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 discussion. It, it would be wonderful if it, if it could have that ripple effect. Um, but what we see uh, up until now is that usually there, for, there are exceptions, but usually um, the citizens' assemblies still take place uh, rather isolated from the rest of society. Uh, the French was kind of an exception, uh, in, which is a good thing. But I think most of the uh, citizens' assemblies, climate assemblies, are taking place um, in a way in a niche. And there should absolutely be much, much more um, uh, attention being paid to how to connect the citizens assembly with the rest of society, be it through a public campaign, um, uh, be it through, uh, for instance, educational programs, um, uh, but also by asking the public to engage, for instance, the um, citizens assembly on um, the abortion law in Ireland, explicitly asked the rest of society to send in their views on abortion, why they thought it was a good idea to, to liberalize the law or not, or why to keep it the way it was. And there were like 13,000 uh, submissions from people all over the country um, giving their viewpoints on this issue. So that there are ways to, which is of course still a one-way uh, street, but uh, there are ways to engage the public, and I think it would be wonderful if if that if we could elaborate elaborate more on that, and if we could find a way to make sure that the conversation that's taking place within the citizens' assembly can also take place in the rest of society. And in that way, the global assembly again is a very good example because mm -hmm. there were these hundred people, the core participants, uh, talking to each other, but there was also this wonderful toolkit that made it possible for anyone in the world to use this toolkit and have a community assembly uh, set it up uh, in their own street or uh, in their own area. So that's that was, I think, uh, one of the best examples of um, uh, making sure that, that um, as much uh, as many people as possible could, in a way, engage in the in the assembly. Marjan, um, just a couple of points to add. Um, the the Parliament of Brussels uh, is doing some really interesting work, and I think that they're really constantly trying to refine the work that they're doing. And I give them a lot of credit for that. Um, a few things that I think are important is they've set up, and I don't know how common this is because I don't know all the deliberative um, platforms that are going around around the world, but um, they have a petition system online. So, you know, the issues are chosen by people. And so in that sense, it is something where the grassroots comes together and chooses the topic that they, they, that they select. So I think that's an important point. And then every single one of their proceedings is online. So even the ones that I missed because I was here in the United States, I was able to watch them live online. Um, I don't know how much the public actually takes advantage of that, but they are online and they have a great website, Democracy Brussels, that, that basically um, explains everything. You can go to it, you can see everything after, before. And another thing that I think that they're considering is whether they should have a public consultation at the end. So invite the public to come and hear about the proceedings at the end of their, um, at the end of their work. And then the last thing that I'll just say is that I think that there's also a problem with the media. I think we should also ask the media why they're not more interested. I think traditional media, I know that at least the one in, in Brussels, um, several of the participants that I spoke to were really interested in having articles written about the work that they did, and they were leaving messages for journalists, and no one was really following up with them. So I think that, you know, that question should also be asked of, 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 of media as to why they're not that interested in covering these issues. 
may, maybe I can respond because that's definitely something uh, we're also looking into. Um, I think a lot of the mainstream media is still very much in this um, um, in this frame of having uh, of. of um, they need the conflict. So they want to report on something that has a conflict in it. There have to be people screaming at each other. There has to be some level of drama. There has to be a lot of conflict. And then it's interesting for media to report on it. But fortunately, there are um, journalists who find ways to report on it in a different way. Uh, but I think there's also some responsibility on our, on our part to help journalists find um, these new ways of uh, reporting on citizens' assemblies because it is, uh, in a way, not a very... Um, it is a different uh, topic, a different phenomenon. I think it's very difficult to, to write about it, but there's, for instance, a wonderful um, uh, piece of journalism by a German uh, journalist on the um, uh, Irish Citizens' Assembly. It's called The Other Guy and Me. I re recommend everybody to read it. It even won the True Story Award. And it really shows how, what a wonderful, engaging story you can make of a Citizens' Assembly. Only it, it, it re requires you to be more creative and to get rid of the, the usual way of, um, uh, of reporting. But it's very interesting to to read. But I think we have to educate journalists a little bit. <laughs> Jump in, Elaine. Um, yeah. So no, this question of how to connect the to the larger public is crucial. I think you can't really do that connection without some kind of referendum being involved, because you can't mobilize people unless there's something at stake. And uh, otherwise, you get the attentive public maybe, but not the whole of you know the the, the community. So. Then the question is, you know, in Ireland, for example, the, 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 I think it was 60% of the country that voted for the um, decriminalization of abortion, which is exactly the percentage of people who had voted uh, for it on the assembly. But the question is, was it causal? Was it really the assembly that convinced the rest of the country to, you know, vote that way? Or was the country already ready and just, and the assembly was just mirroring the, the state of the opinion? I think it's more the latter, actually. I'm not entirely sure, but, um, and I think in the in the French case, we never know because there wasn't a referendum. But what was quite fascinating, though, is that when we um, the social scientists in uh, in France did um, and and polling uh, companies did a survey of of representative sample of French people in June two thousand twenty, and really the the percentage of people who supported the recommendation, the main recommendations in particular of the convention, was striking. For example, the 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 main proposal uh, that came out of the convention, one of the main proposals was to um, make mandatory global retrofitting of all public and private housing in France by a certain date with like sanctions, you know, if you didn't do it and, and, and a massive um, transfer of, of subsidies from, you know, the state to poor uh, households to make it possible. And, and I thought when I saw that come out of the convention, to be honest, I thought, well, this is never going to work. This is way too coercive. Um, the French are not going to sign up for something like that. But then, in fact, and again, it's different from voting in an actual referendum about it, but they said 70, I think it was 74 percent said they would. And I think it was only 57 percent of the um, landlords and landladies, but the 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 it's still amazing that as a whole, you had like a very high number of people in, in, um, in favor. Um, so why am I saying that? I lost my, my thought, but anyway, so just, we need to communicate better indeed and, and try to see the connection between the mini public and the macro public. I agree with the point that Marianne just made about journalists. In fact, I think that was a learning curve for journalists in the convention because they followed, I mean, little by little, they trickled in. And the, the first reflex was always to go for the, very salient um, politician-like personalities, meaning the people who spoke in the plenaries were confrontational, etc. They stood out. But then I think that there was a, a realization that the profiles needed to be more diverse. So they brought in like three citizens at a time on TV shows. And, and I don't know, I think it's, it's a learning curve for, for everyone, frankly. And, uh, and, and so I don't know how we helped journalists learn to tell a collective story instead of like individual narratives. But um, 
it's it's for everyone to, to think about. I think documentaries help. In fact, I I always thought that it's it's fascinating what's going on in these assemblies. There's a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions. It's it's very photogenic, um, filmogenic, if you want. It's just uh, hard to capture for all kinds of privacy reasons and ethical reasons. But it's it's very. I think it could it could sell to the public. <laughs> I think one of the success of the CCC uh, Citizen Commission on Climate is that there is more and more assemblies, citizen assemblies, and there is a great mobilization of the French citizen, and that. That's the, that's the way to speak about uh, climate change is, issues. Um, I'm, I'm saying it's not enough, but uh, I, I'm saying that's, that's the beginning. And um, with the association, Les 150, we are still involved about um, environmental is, issues. And, and I'm also involved uh, in the organ, organization of La Tournée des Tiers Lieux, uh, the third places, if you know that, and that allows us to, to 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 continue to speak about our proposal uh, on local and regional areas, and that's really that's really really have the great uh, impact. Um, so, thank you for your question. Thank you, Agni. And Agni, can you put in the chat the, the website of Les Sans of your association in case people want to? Sure check it out. Um, well, this has been wonderful. And it's very late in France. Um, oh, Elaine, I saw your, 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 uh, oh, no, no, accidental, uh, accidental hand raise. Um, yeah, this has been wonderful. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Agni, for bringing us, many of us together. This wouldn't have happened without me cold emailing you and, and you being so enthusiastic. Um, it's, in, especially in the United States, we're, we're really forming a network um, and, and reaching out to those organizations that have been doing this work for, for longer. And um, I'm really humbled and grateful to be in a space where, where I'm able to do that. And so I'm just happy to be uh, in contact with you all and in conversation with you all. And uh, please, everyone who's on the chat, subscribe to our uh, uh, newsletter, Amor Mundi. Um, reach us on our website and stay tuned for news about our summer school in July. Um, we're really excited to be announcing that in the, in the coming week. Um, yeah, and so thank you all. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Majan. Thank you, uh, Eva. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Agni. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.